Jesus, thank you for this rich opportunity to uh, learn from the hard work and scholarship of Ryan Danker. We're, we're so very grateful for his being here, and we just want to humble ourselves tonight and put ourselves in a listening and learner posture and try to figure out, Lord, what do you have out of this for us, what we, what we can learn both as a nation, as a church, and as a seminar, and as individuals. And we're just so very, again, grateful for uh, Dr. Danker's presence in our midst. We love you together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So glad you all are here. And what I want to do is those of you who are online or even those of you who have your phones with you and you're very, you know, you're not on your phone right now. That's great. If you want to get on your phone for a second and share the Facebook link that we have going live, that will help more people find this lecture. We want more people to be aware of the Chamberlain lectures and the content that Ryan, thank, yeah. Oh, and if Ryan does it, this is a, a Twitter star, if you didn't know. So find Ryan N. Danker, at Ryan N. Danker. Right, is that it? I don't see I even knew it. So you can find him. And so I encourage you to go on and share. This, like, one of the things that can happen is just as people share in various circles, or if there are other groups that you're in, if you have a church group or a Bible study group or a family group, you share to a group that really increases our traffic. Now, the Chamberlain Lecture Series I talked about last night, this is the 34th Chamberlain Lecture. We've had a variety of different kinds of speakers through the years, and somebody here reminded me of my own grandfather spoke and was a Chamberlain lecturer himself. Now, sometimes through the years, we have had preachers, and that would have been the case with my grandfather. He would have come and preached and certainly had an altar call most nights on that time. But then there's been other years where we've had the and that's no problem because you're doing what I asked you to do. So, so like we've had people like Thomas Oden, one of the most significant theologians in our tradition, in the Wesleyan tradition, you know, in the last 50 years who spoke at this. Other prominent speakers through the years have come and participated in this. And, and I was just reminded of the humble way that this lectureship was instituted. It's a beautiful thing that a couple did to make sure that they they didn't take their retirement in the same way that most people would so that they could give at the end of their life. And they gave the Wesley Biblical Seminary so that we could have this event. And so we're thankful to Chamberlain's and for their influence in helping us be here tonight. Now, I want you to know with, with Dr. Danker, I introduced him last night and I mentioned kind of the famous quote about social holiness. And we, what's happened lately in Wesleyan scholarship is it's led us to a place where we recognize that that quote isn't about like some of the things that we would typically understand it to be. And Ryan is helping us get there. This is the challenge that oftentimes can happen, particularly in the Wesleyan holiness movement, which Wesley Biblical Seminary springs from. And it's this is that we can talk a lot about John Wesley. We can talk a lot about John Wesley's theology, but we don't actually read John Wesley. Right. This is, and I had this realization when I went to seminary, my very first class of seminary, finally getting to a place where I read his sermon on perfection and things started to click. And what Ryan has done through his scholarship, and he has studied with the top, some of the top Wesleyan scholars of a past generation. And now he's, I'm going to say, leading the charge for a current generation of Wesleyan scholars. And when I say Wesleyan scholars, not just like somebody who, embraces a Wesleyan theology, Ryan is one who studies John Wesley himself, like our own Chris Lorsifer. There's not many historical theologians who have given their scholarly attention primarily to studying John Wesley. So we are privileged to have Dr. Danker presenting for us tonight. Not only that, Dr. Danker shares the orthodox tradition, the consensual tradition, of the church, and he is an advocate for that, and he has done that in a place that's very difficult to do that, where he might be the only one, one of the only ones, representing the historic orthodox expression of the gospel, and so we're thankful to have somebody who has lived it to come and present to us about John Wesley's political theology. Now, we're going to start, because we didn't get to have this question last night, with a question that came from our own, well, actually, do we have Dr. O'Reilly on? Okay, so I'm going to just finish. He got cut off last night. And so I think this might be a good way. Last night, we had an introduction thinking about the pre, the, the kind of the prehistory, the pre-political history of John Wesley, about the, the nature of like what was going on 
in England and in the church and with John Wesley's parents that led him to place to be the political being that he was. So tonight we're getting more into John Wesley himself, but I think Dr. O'Reilly's question, at least the second part of it, will be a helpful way for us to get you started maybe as a recapish moment. We'll see how that goes. So this was Dr. O'Reilly's question, his response. The relationship between the church and state are legislated and regulated hierarchically through civil and ecclesial authorities. The bottom-up approach seems to be represented by the dissenters of the 17th and 18th centuries. One need only think of Watts' hymns and Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress to make that point. But the artistic and literary cultural artifacts they produced emerged despite the hierarchy, not from it. The question is, which arrangement is preferable? Should Christian culture be decreed from on high? Or should it emerge from independent creativity? To tip my hand, Dr. O'Reilly says, it seems to me that a Wesleyan understanding of resistible grace is difficult to reconcile with the top-down approach to the creation of Christian culture. He's getting good here. <laughs> if grace is not coercive, <laughs> he's meddling. Matt, I hope you're hearing this. How can we legislate liturgical and doctrinal norms that are binding on every person in a particular nation state? Should we not instead prefer that these norms emerge freely as we render to Christ the obedience of faith? Again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to offer this response and reflect on these all important matters for the life of the church and her continued contribution. I tried to do it one breath. Contribution to politics and culture. Maybe that's a nice little introduction. Greet Dr. Denker with me. Thanks, everyone. Um, okay, Matt's question. Um, essentially, he's trying to make me stand up for the Church of England. Um, okay. Top down versus bottom up. I don't think it's an either or. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the via media here and be a good yeah. Anglican. Um, the, the Church of England, as I understand it, and, you know, as it develops, et cetera, et cetera, is not simply a, a top-down um, institution, even to this day. It constitutes the Christian umbrella under which the Christian people of England worshipped God. And it created a culture that, in fact, made people like Isaac Watts possible. Um, the dissenters, I don't think they ever really gave credit to the Anglican culture in which they lived. They rebelled against it in certain ways because they didn't like bishops and they didn't want to wear red wedding rings and they didn't like liturgical texts that bound them in certain ways. Um, but at the same time, the dissenters, and for those of you who don't know what a dissenter is, because that's not, that's not a term that we always use. The dissenters were those who couldn't subscribe to the Church of England and were allowed a legal status, it's called toleration. Um, they were second class citizens in this period, a small portion of the population, but they did produce some, some fascinating, as, as Matt O'Reilly brought up, some fascinating literary figures. Um, and Isaac Watts is a great example. And for those of you who don't know Isaac Watts, you probably sung many of his hymns. Um, so, um, so you do actually know him somewhat. Okay. Right. Joy to the world. Which is a good Advent hymn, by the way. Yes, as Dr. Powers would point out. Um, so, huh? The problem is, of course, we're in a we're in a context where there is no established church, and so um, to Matt's question in that regard, um, hmm. Anyway, this could lead into an entire yeah, lecture. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I I actually like hierarchy. Um, and um, and I do like liturgy. I, I think liturgy should be flexible enough to be enculturated, however. And I think that's key. Um, but liturgy actually provides us with the, with the words to worship God that we might not actually have on our own. And, and I know some of us might not come from traditions that claim to be liturgical, but if someone started the Lord's Prayer in here, we would all join in immediately and probably in the good king's language. Um, so there is a sense in which liturgical norms have shaped um, all of us. So 
Okay, I'm going to go with the Via Media on that one. All right, now now to John Wesley. Um, and sometimes John Wesley was hierarchical. Sometimes he was a, a bull in a china shop, but uh, that's John Wesley. Okay, so the lecture. Uh, the title is A Soft-Hearted Tory in the Whig World, um, which those are political parties at the time, for those of you who don't know. But anyway, let's, let's start. So John Wesley was conceived as the result of an intra-Tory political battle that was initially launched at the dining room table of the Epworth Rectory in rural Lincolnshire. So this political debate quickly extended then, as you probably figured out, to the bedroom and ultimately separated Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Thank you, you're getting the joke here. Um, <laughs> although this is true. <laughs> the battle ended in a stalemate. Um, it lasted for almost a year. But anyway, the fruit, so to speak, of the reconciliation eventually was John Wesley. <laughs> Fun, yes, the history is fascinating, guys. Come on. All right. So the fight over the, uh, that, they, that they launched at that dining room table was over the nature of kingship. This is what they fought about at their dining room table. <laughs> Who, in reality, was the rightful king? The year was 1701 and 1702, and the king on the throne, at least, was William III. Samuel Wesley said prayers for the king because he was a good um, clergyman of the Church of England, and his wife, Susanna, had refused to say amen. His response was this, Suki, if we are to have two kings, we shall have two beds. Suki, every, every, all the Wesleys had nicknames, by the way. John's was Jackie. All right. Um, Susanna was a Jacobite. She was a supporter of the direct heirs of James II. And in her mind, the glorious revolution was anything but glorious. And the result had been a disaster in which the nation was plunged into an era with pseudo rulers. All right. God's chosen was left to linger in France and later in Rome in a competing court waiting for his return. So, interestingly, Susanna was not the only person in the Wesley family who held to such um, what were at the time probably extreme political views, nor was she the only person in early Methodism who, in fact, was a Jacobite. It's very likely that Samuel Wesley Jr. was a Jacobite. He's the oldest of the Wesley brothers. He was definitely connected to Jacobite circles in London and even to the infamous Bishop Atterbury, who was put on trial. It was the trial of the century, they thought, of course. Anyway, um, he was put on trial for his Jacobite politics and run out of the country. Lord and Lady Huntington were also Jacobites. And it's thought that Lord Huntington actually died of a broken heart because so many of his friends were executed after the failure of the 1745 rebellion. She, of course, Lady Huntington, Selina Huntington, would play a key role in the unfolding of the evangelical revival. And she would plant societies just like John Wesley would. Eventually she would end up in dissent. But John Wesley was not a Jacobite, despite, despite many people who pointed fingers at him and tried to make him seem so. The period in question though, was a period in which Tories like John Wesley were often accused of Jacobitism if for no other reason than it was a useful political tool uh, used by the Whigs to slander their opponents. But John Wesley grew up to share in many respects his high church Tory father's perspective. Tonight, what I want to do is explore that and to look at some of the documents that we have from Wesley's own hand related to political or public matters. Most of these writings, interestingly enough, um, and thank you for mentioning the sermons, by the way, read the sermons. I thought we should have like um, t-shirts, read more Wesley. Um, but some of the, the writings I'm gonna look at relate to, to politics. And most of these are from the 1760s onwards. So John Wesley's life, right? 1701 to, um, sorry, 1703 to 1791. That would have been bad. Um, this is in the latter part of his life, right? This is in the last third of his life, 1760s onward. And if there are three political topics he was most vocal about, they were, one, his support for the Hanoverian dynasty, unlike his mother, his opposition to the American Revolution, and his opposition to slavery. 
but it was his faith and his commitment to biblical Christianity that undergirds his entire political worldview. And we need to keep that in mind. That's going to be key to the entire enterprise. I'll touch on this more, but even John Wesley's concept, concept of rights, uh, more limited than our own in this country, by the way, is not based on the idea that rights are inherent to humanity, but that rights are derived from the revelation of God. It's not entirely easy, in fact, to put together Wesley's political perspective apart from his own admin, admonition later in life when he said that he was a high churchman, the son of a high churchman. By the way, a high churchman uh, in this period was in, immediately linked to a, what was seen to be a Tory political perspective. The power for those of you, here's a recap from last night, power for the Tories derived from God to the king, the king then extended that power to the parliament, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Whigs would be different. Most of them would believe it comes from God, but it was most likely represented the, in Parliament as the, as the ones who held the power as the representatives of the people. By the way, read the Declaration of Independence. You'll see a Whig argument for power in the Declaration. All right, so, but John Wesley, a high churchman, the son of a high churchman. The thing is, though, John Wesley was not a politician. That, let's make that clear. Nor, uh, I should add, am I going to try to turn him into one tonight or tomorrow. In fact, one of his writings, um, here's the title, Free Thoughts on the Present State of Public Affairs in a Letter to a Friend, 1766. He wrote this. He said, I am no politician. Politics lie quite out of my province. Neither have I any acquaintance, at least no intimacy, with any that bear that character. In other words, he didn't live in Washington, D.C., He goes on to argue that one should be well informed before forming political opinions, claiming that such awareness of the facts are not easily attained. Um, and he spends considerable effort in this document arguing against quick judgments on political matters. In fact, Wesley hesitantly lays out his thoughts in this text on public affairs, arguing that he is open to the idea that further information could change his mind. I think that's a wonderful approach to politics. The rise of Methodism, however, despite Wesley's best efforts to stay out of politics was seen by many to be a political venture. The context made it in fact nearly impossible not to see Methodism as a political organ or at least a societal movement that appeared at least to the establishment as though it was upending society. And I think we have to remember that Methodism, which itself is a subset of the larger transatlantic evangelical revival, was launched between two Jacobite rebellions. So let's go back to Susanna's political perspective. This, in fact, colored the situation immensely for those who launched the revival, or I should put it this way, those who were swept up by the revival. That's a much better way. In fact, during the second Jacobite rebellion of 1745, Wesley toyed with the idea of organizing a Methodist militia. Thankfully, he never carried that out. <laughs> you can imagine what that would have looked like. That's it, right? yes. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> but we can toss Wesley's idea. I'm not talking about the general. Um, we can toss Wesley's idea onto the pile of wilder ideas that he had. Um, one idea that he also never carried out was founding a vegetarian commune. They don't tell you this stuff in Sunday school, do they? At the heart of the Jacobite rebellion was, um, just like in the last century, the question of monarchy itself. No major figure in the 18th century, however, uh, I want to make this clear, promoted republicanism. That was not what they were debating. They were debating the, the nature of monarchy, not whether you should have one. Um, and of course, the source of power then is, is going to be key to any kind of political discourse within a discussion of the nature of monarchy. But the two rebellions, the 45 and the 15, I'm sorry, yeah, the 15 and the 45, were launched with general Catholic support. In other words, on the continent, Catholic support in Britain for the few Catholics who were there. And um, it was intended to place the Stuarts back on the throne, the Stuart dynasty, 
uh, dominating the, the earlier century. In 1714, Queen Anne had died, the last of James II's children to actually rule. She'd been a favorite of Tory high churchmen in England, but she'd been unable to produce an heir and she suffered greatly during the last years of her life, both physically and emotionally. It's a very sad story, um, especially of the, the number of uh, miscarriages that she experienced. Uh, she was plagued with gout um, and much pain. Anyway, she died at Kensington Palace in 1714. The search for the next viable and legal, now what does that mean? It means Protestant, heir, then brought the Hanoverians to the throne uh, in the person of George the First. Now, George the First, and this is very easy. You can remember all the kings after him all the way into the 1820s. George one, two, three, and four. But George one was thoroughly German. His coronation, held of course at Westminster Abbey, had to be held in Latin because he didn't understand English, and the English people there couldn't speak to him in German, so they had to do it in Latin. But the introduction of a new dynastic house actually lit fires under the Stuarts and their uh, supporters. Now, the 15 and the 45, neither of the rebellions were in fact successful. The Hanoverians and therefore the Protestants remained on the throne. The result of the rebellions though was to further define England as a Protestant nation. And for, many, and for some time to paint any Roman Catholic as a potential traitor or worse. Interestingly enough, most Jacobites in England were not Catholics. Something that, yeah, it's interesting. But the rebellions will actually help the English to define themselves as a Protestant nation. And in fact, Linda Coley, a great historian, has argued that these events defined Englishness as Protestant. One of the sad realities of the rebellions, and for those of you who are Outlander fans, this will make some sense to you, um, was the suppression of the Scottish Highlander culture. Um, they were the strongest supporters of the Stuarts. And this included a ban on tartans, right? Those tartans were not allowed until Queen Victoria's time. Wesley's own commitment to the Hanoverians comes out in 1745, not just in his desire to raise a militia, but in his in his unwavering commitment to a Protestant monarchy. And I think this is key to understanding John Wesley's monarchical commitments. In his mind, the monarchy was ordained by God, certainly, but it was ordained of God to preserve the Church of England. And any challenge to the church, in this case, with a potential Catholic monarch, was to be opposed. That's gonna be really important, especially uh, for those of you who remember the Ancien Regime model, where does the power lie with the church, with the monarch, or with the gentry class? And what's, how does that power play out? How does it shift? For John Wesley, it's with the church. Um, and therefore, the monarchy and the parliament are going to have to somehow be in line with the Church of England. Now, there is a relationship here, and Wesley was aware of it between the maintenance of a Protestant monarch and a Protestant church. And as Wesley prayed the daily office in, the, in the, the service of morning prayer in the Book of Common Prayer, the prayer for the King's majesty included a plea that the King might be replenished, here's from the prayer book, with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that he may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. This way and this will, by the way, is Protestant. In so many ways, one additional repercussion of the 45 Rebellion and its swift uh, conclusion at the Battle of Culloden was what might be called the final gasp of the English Reformation. We have already seen how the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 returned the liturgical and Episcopal character of the church. In 1688-89, a way is made for those who cannot agree to the settlement. And now in 1745, we have the last gasps of any challenge to what can be called a reformed Catholicism within the Anglican tradition. Politically though, and even for most Tories like Wesley, 
who supported the Hanoverians, there was still enough hesitancy on the part of some Tories at the introduction of a German prince over an English nation, right? And because of this, uh, George I then highly favored the Whig party. This is the beginning of what's called by historians as the Whig ascendancy. And this would include the rise of, Wal of Robert Walpole, who was the first prime minister of Great Britain. And as the church was a part of the establishment, this, this meant shifts in the church as Whigs were then appointing senior leadership within the church. Keep in mind with an established church, bishops are appointed by well, ultimately the monarch but in this case, with the rise of the prime minister's office, uh, the prime minister is going to have quite a bit of say. In fact, this, this process has been adjusted, but it's still there uh, in the Church of England. Now, what's fascinating, though, is we have, a sh we have this shift politically with the senior leadership, the bishops, some of the deans of the cathedrals, et cetera, et cetera, and especially the chaplains to the, to the king. Um, they're being named, and these are Whigs, many of the moderate Whigs, the clergy, the rank and file clergy who are actually running the parishes are still predominantly Tories. And so you've got this interesting separation now between rank and file priests and their hierarchy within the church. I've already told you that, uh, reminded you of the difference between Tories and, and Whigs in the period. Um, so I won't, so I'll skip that part of the lecture. All right. But for Wesley, the answer was that power resides in God and God extends it to the king. He had no doubts about that. But he rejected royalist absolutism, which is represented by the Stuarts. And so if you want to summarize his particular pers political perspective, he was a constitutional monarchist. Now, it's fascinating that Billy Abraham argued a few years ago at a conference in Washington, D.C., that Wesley was a political Burkean following the writings of Burke, William Burke. Burke was a Whig, interestingly enough. Billy or Abraham's point, sorry, we all, we all know him so, we know him so well that we just refer to him generally as Billy and everyone knew who we were talking about. Abraham's point was that Wesley was a traditionalist who took seriously the development of a distinctly English political culture with an inherently conservative outlook on matters of continuity and change. Now, you will note in this lecture, for instance, to show you an example of that conservative, inherently conservative outlook, that Wesley never supports in any way rebellion. Doesn't matter whether it's the Jacobite rebellion or the American one. Famously, though, Burke supported the American Revolution. So there's one distinction that um, I wish I could ask Bill Abraham about. At the same time, Wesley did support a basic concept of rights, which he felt were best maintained by the constitutional monarchy as it had developed out of the storms that I described last night. Um, so within a constitutional monarchical viewpoint, Wesley argued for what he termed religious freedom and civil liberty. Now, before I move on, I do wanna be careful. Um, I can refer to, I'll put it this way. Wesley will use some similar language to our own political discourse, but we have to be careful not to assume he means what we mean by those terms. So I'm gonna to try to be careful in, uh, in defining some of these terms carefully. For instance, with religious liberty, Wesley rarely includes Catholics in his pronouncements on religious liberty, primarily because he saw Catholicism as a political threat to the Protestant ascendancy. But he will, and he will actually, in fact, take this too far because uh, in his own day in 1780, his words helped to ignite an anti-Catholic riot that came to be known as the Catholic riots and many people die. So when we're talking about his belief in religious liberty, keep in mind, it's limited. In his 1772 thoughts on liberty, Wesley argues this. He says, religious liberty is a liberty to choose our own religion to worship God according to our own conscience, according to the best light we have. Every man living as man has a right to this as he is a rational creature. The creator gave him this right when he endowed him with understanding. And every man must judge for himself because every man must give an account of himself to God. 
Consequently, this is an indefeasible right. It is inseparable from humanity. And God did never give authority to any man or number of men to deprive any child of man thereof under any color or pretense, whatever. Note the source of that right, though. That's really key to his, his politics. The source is God. In fact, the right is indefeasible because it is required of God that every person comes to him in faith. Notice how his theology is, in fact, shaping his very concept of rights. And the role of government in this case, you could summarize it this way, get out of the way. <laughs> Religious liberty will play a role in the Wesleyan revival on numerous occasions. In fact, Wesley and George Whitfield and some others will take, will launch lawsuits against people who will try to limit Methodist meetings. Uh, and they take this all the way to what's called the King's Bench. And um, I can't remember a time where Wesley lost those arguments. So Wesley's Methodism, though, is often con uh, confusing to the authorities because essentially his Methodism is a confederation of small groups meeting across the country um, that are not officially connected to the Church of England, and yet John Wesley this entire time is declaring that they're not dissenting. So what are they? He's kind of playing into this, the legal limbo of the act of toleration. The only way he can do this, by the way, is because he is a priest of the Church of England and claims that if he's in charge of these groups, they can't possibly be dissenting. It's really quite a political, uh, it's, either, it's either political brilliance or political naivete. Um, so depending on your, on your perspective, you can go with either one. They were acting like dissenters in the Church of England, but technically didn't fit because they had Anglican leadership. Here, however, in his text on liberty, there is no limbo at all. I hope you noticed that. Wesley clearly believed that one must have the liberty to choose their own religion. And by implication, by the way, to choose your own religion is to practice it. Secondly, we have from Wesley this concept of civil liberty. And his vision for civil, civil liberty is this. It's a liberty to enjoy our lot, sorry. A liberty to enjoy our lives and fortunes in our own way, to use our own property, whatever is legally your own, according to your own choice. Sounds like many people in this country, in fact. His greatest challenge is in fact aimed at those who claim that English persons have lost their liberty relative to property. He sees no proof of this. But instead, he sees some in public who are making these claims and thus disturbing the public peace. And in this regard, his venom in this piece isn't toward anyone taking away these liberties. He's aiming his venom, venom at those who rile up crowds, who produce mobs, or who do anything like that to disturb public order. The English, according to Wesley, have true religious and civil liberty. But what does the mob want? They want what Wesley calls liberty of another kind. So he's trying to define liberty in this, in this particular piece as well. He argues that many misunderstand the nature of liberty and replace it or confuse it with anarchy, where murder, plunder, war, violence toward women, he specifically names that, violence toward women, and murdering their prince, that's referring to Charles I, is the end result. This is to be opposed by what he calls reasonable men and men of honor. For this is not liberty at all, but in fact, he says, this is the result of sin. He believes that all of this, the desire for irrational liberties, stems from both the devil and from a press, a media, that has filled the people with poison toward their king and government. He then engages the question of reigning in the press. Bet you didn't know Wesley dive, dove into that, huh? <laughs> And he ends up supporting a modified form of libel laws. He says this, but should he not be punished who published palpable lies and such lies as manifestly tend to breed dissension between the king and his subjects? He then talks about cutting off ears and things which you don't need to hear about. In more than one of his publications, Wesley was keen to take on um, libelous uh, 
language and anyone in the media who was instigating violence. For him, the free publication of lies in effect then undermines the liberties of the English people. You will note in his assessment here that liberty is not something that lacks responsibility. And I think that's key to a Wesleyan vision. In fact, liberty implies responsibility in Wesley's political thought. And we'll see more of this as we look at his views related to the poor and slavery. But what about the English people and voting? I bet you all wonder what he thinks about voting. Um, Wesley is famous for saying we are no Republicans, uh, lowercase r. Um, he said this to the conference. He was not going to let them vote on doctrine. And by the way, he didn't like voting in general. But let's listen to what he says. In his in an earlier treatise that he wrote um, on public policy, Wesley argues against common voting. Now, keep in mind, um, there, was, you know, there was not universal suffrage at this time. The, the very concept that most people were voting was anathema. No one was thinking about this. A very small sliver of the population in fact, you had to be a man who owned a significant amount of land to vote, okay? So that's the context. So let's, let's keep that in mind. Um, but what does he say about this, about voting in general? It argues that there's necessary knowledge needed to rightly govern and govern well, and therefore to form a tolerable judgment of them, government measures, requires not only a good understanding, but more time than common tradesmen can spare and better information than can possibly than they can possibly procure i think therefore that the encouraging them to pass their verdict on ministers of state yea on king lords and commons is not only putting them out of their way but doing them more mischief than they are aware of okay he would not fit well in the american context with that language <laughs> okay let's be honest but this viewpoint is a part of his political worldview that took seriously the necessity of a hierarchical society. There you go, Matt O'Reilly. And English and the English in this period are a distinctly hierarchical people. For Wesley, as for Tories generally, and for most English commentators in the period, this is not a bad thing. Hierarchy is ordained of God for the common good. That's how it's viewed. I realize in American context, we have this negative reaction to it. What I'm trying to help us do is understand why he would have a positive reaction to it. It places at the helm of the kingdom a monarch who with his or her ministers and the parliament and the apparatus of state, which includes the bishops, can rightly govern the nation. J.C.D. Clark in his monumental volume called English Society 1660 to 1832 outlines this political worldview. What it implies, by the way, is a great deal of trust. It also implies that God's providential work in the world needs to be taken seriously. And I think that's one of the keys to understanding Wesley's disinterest in common voting rights. God is at work with or without our votes and has set up a structure to maintain the peace and to, and to promote the common good. There's a lot of trust in there. I realize that, especially for an American ear. <laughs> but that's how they're going to view it. Now, this doesn't mean that he was averse to taking political shots at political figures, all right? Far from it. Uh, there's that trust, sure. And there's a trust in the providence of God, but he will take shots at, at politicians. Um, and it was, and it's, sorry, it, it goes together with the providential worldview, but it also is another thing, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow. Throughout the period, there is a, a political perspective and actually is in the church and the state and it's uh, an inherent deference for those in authority so deference is going to be a key theme and, I'm, and again something that we might not have in the u.s at the moment but uh something to keep in mind if you're understanding the 18th century now one way that wesley is very much concerned with political rulers at every level is whether or not they are men and women of character in his four volume, Short History of England, by the way, I love it, short history, four volumes. <laughs> Wesley refers to Henry VIII as a tyrant. And he calls Charles II one of the most immoral monarchs to ever reign. So character matters to Wesley. And he'll even take shots at God's anointed, notice. 
This can be linked to the role that these persons play within the God-ordained hierarchy. Sin makes it less likely that one can fulfill their God-ordained function. Think of holiness, right? Here we go. Um, right, sin makes it less likely for us to fulfill our God-ordained function. I think that'll actually preach. At its heart, Wesley envisioned holiness as a full restoration of individuals, yes, but also of society and the entire created order. Humanity had been created to be vice regents of God's good creation, but in their sin, they had failed at their task. Now, by the grace of God and the person and work of Jesus Christ, full restoration is possible, and this can be seen in part by a person's character. So on many occasions, we can see Wesley's linkage between ruling well and being a person of character. One of my favorites is when he defends George III. He's arguing he's a good ruler. Why, how does he argue this? He says, the king knows the Bible, fears God, and loves his wife. And that's the beginning of his argument around why he's a man of character. And for Wesley, this was a sign of honor and understanding. In other words, the king is attuned to the revelation of God and his actions, both in fear of God and in love of the queen. And these indicate a character shaped by revelation. So character mattered for John Wesley, especially in the public square. And character brings, up finally, brings us finally to Wesley's views on our responsibilities to the poor and in opposition to slavery. Keep in mind that within Wesley's viewpoint, God offers us great and good gifts, and God expects us to use those gifts wisely. Theologians such as Randy Maddox and Ken Collins have described Wesley's view of grace itself as responsible or even cooperative grace. In other words, we have a role to play in this interaction with God. Or you could put it this way, this isn't entirely about us. God's transforming process in us, in fact, has social repercussions and responsibilities. Now I'm getting into next tomorrow's lecture, uh, lecture a bit, though. All right. But Wesley's political views related to the poor and slavery reveal a complex, complex systemic approach to the politics of the day. In his Thoughts on the Present Scarcity of Provisions, written in 1773, he provides a complex analysis, beginning with the question of why food is so scarce, followed by questions about the lack of work. His argument is that the skyrocketing cost of food has made it impossible for the nation to spend its money on anything else, thus undermining other parts of the economy and causing a shortage of work opportunities. It's interesting, this, this, this kind of, now. Yeah. The skyrocketing cost of food, he claims, lays at the foot of the distilling industry and their use of basic foodstuffs, thus making food itself more expensive. He tries to figure out how much wheat they're using to make what he calls deadly poison. Um, <laughs> he argues that up to half of the wheat in England is being used for distilling, um, converting it into deadly poison, poison that naturally destroys not only the strength and life, but also the morals of our countrymen, all right? This is a systemic approach, in other words, and he's more than happy to point his fingers at the distillers. Uh, he was not a teetotaler, I should have, have to be historically honest, but he was more than happy to go after the gin distilleries that had risen up, more like, um, to understand gin in the period, think more moonshine um, than, than you might gin. But anyway, he's taking shots at them. The scarcity of oats, he then ties to the increase in horses kept for coaches and chases. With the increased need for horses, cattle and sheep are not being raised in the same numbers as before, thus pushing up the price of beef and mutton. Pork, poultry, and eggs are increasing in price because of the rise of large agribusiness. In addition, small farms are being swallowed up by larger ones, decreasing the diversity of goods. Finally, he blames luxury for scarcity. The wealthy were wasting provisions and exorbitant taxes were then driven by national debt and ballooning government. 
Notice he's, I mean, layer after layer after layer after layer. He says this, to sum up the whole, thousands of people throughout the land are perishing for want of food. This is owing to various causes, but above all, to distilling, taxes, and luxury. Here is the evil and the undeniable cause of it. So how does Wesley offer his, what he calls, hints to fixing the problem? One, he flat out says, end distilling. Yeah, <laughs> we've got the salvationist, amen. Um, in, and it's fascinating for somebody to say, just completely end an entire industry, all right? Think about that. Two, reduce the number of horses. And in fact, he says, send them to France. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or tax owners of horses who are not using them for production. In other words, not using them on farms. And then he says, streamline government. All right, now he sounds an awful lot like a small government conservative, but okay, <laughs> let's be careful here. Um, note what he's doing. His entire political vision is predicated on helping the less fortunate. Everything he outlines is in fact not you know the distilling industry is not the point it's what's happening to the poor Amen. it's what's happening to the vulnerable the vulnerable um and in fact the whole point of this is not to get the economy going just because that is in and of itself is a good thing nor to lower taxes for the sake of a certain vision of the role of government okay you have to we have to look we have to understand i think why he's saying these things his entire purpose is to help the poor and because of this, you will note he actually curtails one of the rights he'd supported so strongly before, right? The right to private property or what he called civil liberty. He believes that a moral government will tax goods to help the common good. In this case, those who are without food and without work, All right? So it's, I, I do want us to understand what he's doing here, right? He says you have the right to own property, but then he's also talking about sending your horses to France, okay? So in the end, his moral vision uh, takes precedence. Undergirding this approach is what I think his firm commitment to the doctrine of the Imago Dei, right? All people are made in the image of God. This, in fact, is the basis of his opposition to slavery, Again, limiting what some of the time saw as property rights, okay? One cannot own another who is likewise made in the image of God. For in God, we have perfect liberty. Liberty, in fact, to worship God and not to fear for our life or property, but also responsibility then to the less fortunate, those in chains who are, like us, participants in God's good creation and his work of renewal. Wesley's politics was driven by this responsibility, precisely because he believed that one's political perspective must begin and end following the source of power himself. In other words, in God alone. Thank you. So I'd like for you all to think about any questions you might have for Dr. Denker, and we invite our friends online to submit questions either in the Zoom chat or in the Facebook chat. We have people moderating, moderating both of those and passing those questions on to me, but we have asked our own Wesley Scholar, Dr. Chris Lorschiffer, to offer a response. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, great lecture. Uh, so one of the interesting things I found about Wesley, and it comes in several places, and you were kind of saying this without saying these exact words, but what I find in Wesley is an idealism that, that finds itself butting up against reality. So he has a big idealistic concept, but he does come to reality and say, yeah, this is what we got. So I'm thinking about his... Uh, being a part of Oxford, he, uh, he was required each year to either preach a chapel at St. Mary's or pay somebody to do it. And he, he did speak there multiple times, but in 1744, he preached a sermon that after that sermon, they said, you know what, we'll pay somebody <laughs> to preach in your place. And so it was just, you know what I'm talking about. Scriptural, scriptural Christianity is... Um, is the, uh, the picture. So as he looks at the church in the book of Acts, he, he asks this question. Now remember, this is the leadership 
these are re the religious leadership uh, of the country. And, you know, he says, um, first, I would ask, where does this Christianity now exist? He gives this idealistic picture of Book of Acts. Everybody's filled with the spirit, etc. Where does this Christianity now exist? Where, I pray, do the Christians live? Which is the country, the inhabitants whereof, that are all filled with the Holy Ghost, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Then it comes down at, a little later. Brethren, I'm persuaded better things of you, though I thus speak. Let me ask you then, in tender love and in the spirit of meekness, is this city a Christian city? Is Christianity, scriptural Christianity, found here, etc.? And yeah, and it, it was it was offensive to them, which I can see. Uh, so that's my that's my main my main thought. I'm I'm thinking here is that. He, he's an idealist, even politically, that butts up against reality and therefore would critique these politicians, etc. So my, my question is, you know, the, the motto about spreading scriptural holiness and reforming the nation. Wesley, um, he, he's, he thought the Church of England was the church. You know, this is, this is the church of God. Uh, but could you speak to that? butting up against reality that would make him say, we're, we are a Christian nation, we are the church, but we've got to reform the nation. Could you uh, maybe touch on that reality versus idealism? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I mean, Wesley was definitely an idealist. Um, I think what Wesley often did and we see this when he went to Georgia. Um, you know what I'm talking about already. So John Wesley goes to Georgia. And what, he's, what he imagines in his mind that he's doing is essentially trying to create an outpost of primitive Christianity in, on the, in the pure soil of Georgia where there's, there's been no corruption from civilization. Um, anybody from Georgia, you're welcome. Um, and of course, he gets there and he realizes very quickly that uh, all the, the supposed corruption of civilization as, as, as is there. And that in fact, people do sin in Georgia. Um, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he kind of, that, that's, you know, we, we talk about the Georgia period where he obviously messed things up with his girlfriend and then is run out of town as a criminal. Um, but, and he comes back to England and he's just, he's just uh, depressed. Um, and I think it's because he's re there's this sense in him, and it happens over and over again, where he has this, this ideal, ideal vision of what he wants, of what he believes God wants for us. And then, yes, he runs into the reality of the human situation over and over again. What's beautiful, though, is that he maintains his optimistic theology, mainly because he believes that grace is more powerful than sin. Um, and I think that's one of the gifts of the Wesleyan movement to, to the church is to remind it that we have an optimistic vision. Um, and so despite setbacks uh, to his idealism, um, he finds different ways. Now, politically, and this is something I didn't include in the lecture, I should have, but until, and, it, and it's one of the reasons you don't see a lot of his political writings until later in life. At first, he was putting all of his hopes in the, uh, the accession to the throne of the Prince of Wales um, in, uh, it would have been in, I'm trying to remember which George this is off the top of my head, between George the second and George the third. All right. Yeah, George two and a half. Um, and the Prince of Wales would have brought in um, a more staunchly Tory government. And he thought this was going to be a good thing and answer all their problems. Not all their problems, but many of their problems. But he was killed in a freak sporting accident um, uh, by what they called at the time a tennis ball. Um, it was not what we call a tennis ball. He was not killed by a soft little grain ball. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but there's a shift there where he stops relying on, on human leaders to fulfill that vision. And really, you know, his ultimate vision for this idealized world, he actually instills into the societies of Methodism as reforming agents for the church and the nation. And I think that's, I'm going to talk about that more tomorrow. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, 
but it set me up perfectly. <laughs> but it's he, what he does with these these intentional Christian communities, and I and in some of my writings I call them communities of the new birth. They're designed specifically to lead someone through the through the way of salvation, um, so that you know because as as Andy said yesterday, uh, there's no holiness but social holiness. I mean, you can't be holy on your own. And so these groups are actually set up to produce and enable holiness. Now, obviously, God is the one who actually produces holiness. But Wesley, Wesley produced a system that, that brought accountability, that brought um, support, that brought the means of grace and the sacraments and other things to actually make this possible. So, yeah, he shifts. He definitely does shift in his, uh, because of the, the balance between ideology and reality. But I, I'm actually very thankful he held on to that optimism, even to the end. So thank you, Chris. Do we have any other questions? I don't know if we have any online or any questions in the room. Is that question coming from Dr. Ayers? Oh, oh, right. OK, I was looking for questions there. Well, I, I'm curious, if you, maybe if you're going to go there tomorrow, I can ask another question. Yeah. But curious just to talk uh, for those who might not know about John West's opposition to the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just curious. I was trying could... to avoid that. I, know. Um, I, I mean, I can talk about it a little bit. So initially he was um, not opposed to it. He was kind of curious about it, um, which I mean, most people in England were. They thought, you know, what is going on? There's debates over taxes and tea and candles and things. Um, and of course, from the English perspective, the Americans were rebelling because they didn't want to pay the price of the, um, the war with the native, native populations in France that actually made the colony sustainable. Um, that was their view of us. Um, essentially what it boils down to is Wesley said, you're handing over the rights and privileges of Englishmen for an unknown future. And um, no guarantee necessarily that you'll have those rights and liberties. Um, yeah, I was actually, yeah, that, you know, we, we know what happened later, but that was no guarantee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, all warm hearted now. Um, yeah, but there was a lot of question about what this would produce, what this would produce, would it produce liberty? The other thing is, um, Wesley was adamantly opposed to a rebellion. There's, there's that conservative streak in him that uh, rebellion, especially against the king, was seen as as probably derived from sin. So that was that was definitely his perspective on that one. Thank you. Yeah, and you, you could you, by the way, his writings on that um, uh, are it's short. I mean, the pamphlet that he produced, he didn't. By the way, um, he took somebody else's writings, truncated it, changed a few words, and then put his name on it. Um, it he did. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you liked somebody's work and you really wanted to get it out there, then that's what you did. Um, and and it's you can you can find it online easily, and it's it's a quick read, and you can you can do that. And I will mention it again tomorrow. Um, some okay. of his because what he does is he creates a huge headache for American Methodists. But that's uh, another story. I imagine uh, I met, we might in our own theology of John Wesley class. Will we cover that, Chris? Yeah. 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 We're, we're all, I, I know that you might ask me what the answer is, but we're offering that in the summer. Is that the idea? <laughs> I know I forgot. I forgot that I'm in charge of that. Uh, so yeah, but anyways, check out, that's another great class to audit theology of John Wesley. Um, so it's something we offer regularly. And of course, you know, it's so interesting. Of course, this is Wesley biblical seminary. All right. We have a question from online. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. My old ethics professor, Dr. James Thobaben. Oh no. <laughs> good to see you yeah hi jim <laughs> um did thoughts on slavery leave open rebellion did thoughts on slavery leave open rebellion? okay and, and tell him what he's referring to with thoughts on slavery. It's, it's a document that wesley wrote in opposition to slavery um and like i said like i mentioned earlier it's it pivots on the doctrine of the imago day did that open up i don't know jim um a thing to remember about Wesley is that he saw violence itself as a repercussion of sin. Uh, he called war the proof of original sin. So 
Hmm. I would tend toward no. That would be my, my guess on that one. I'll have to look at the document again with that particular question in mind. But given, given Wesley's generally conservative approach, um, he would find other ways. I imagine that at least there would be attempts at other ways first um, before any kind of armed rebellion that caused bloodshed. Um, that, yeah, that, that, that would be my approach to it, but I'll have to look that up and he'll probably call you know, me. You know who it was? Uh, the, I read, I read uh, the document on the American Revolution and yeah. Thoughts on Slavery. Yeah. It was Jim Thobain. Yeah. Got, so anyways, that's go. when I first read that. Okay, so <laughs> Jonathan Rogers asked, and I think this this deals with this question of idealism, and this is important for ministry leaders to think about the nature of like what we're called to do, and particularly when you get in those first few years outside of seminary. Here, here's a question. I'm not. I don't know Jonathan. He says, if the Book of Acts is our standard for the church, are we idealist? If, Put on your biblical theology hat. If the Book of Acts, like, listen, <laughs> um, because the Book of because Acts. Because of the Book of Acts. Um, <laughs> Are we idealists given the book of Acts? Yeah. Yeah, I think we are. Um, yeah, I think there are times when we need to be um, idealistic about the church. Um, and in fact, you know, we, I mean, what, what's that old hymn? There's, it's a glorious church without spot or, spot or wrinkle. And we sing that without winking, right? <laughs> Um, right, because the church obviously is, is made up of sinners, but it's also the, it is the bride of Christ. It is the body of Christ, right? Those who are found in him are in fact the church and they're filled with him in, in his, in his supper. So it is idealized, but it's also grace filled. And so I think it's justifiably idealized. Um, there's my biblical theological hat. How's that? Um, it, it really is something. And I think, well, actually the prayer book does a really good job with this. Uh, you know, if you, when you go through the liturgy of the prayer book as a, as a congregation, it, there's, there's the confession of sin. That's really thorough, by the way. <laughs> and in the old prayer book, in the middle of that, it says, and there is no health in us. I mean, you know, miserable offenders. Um, but then actually, once you take the Eucharist, um, it talks about, it says again, you know, we're not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Uh, and then it speaks about how we are filled with Christ in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So there's, it's, it's reality. Yes. Right. There's the reality of our, of our fallen nature and the sins that we uh, are prone to. But then there's the reality of Christ's presence, cleansing, transforming presence. Amen. And so I think um, the answer to that is yes. Of course, I, should I quote the book of Acts in this? I'm not sure. Um, look what they did. They met together uh, from house to house, as it says in 2020. But they also partook of, of, the, of uh, uh, they met at the Lord's Supper. They partook of the, of the, um, the apostles' teaching, and they cared for one another. That's a great model, and I think one we can be optimistic about. Amen. We have a good question here, uh, and it comes, and you'll you'll pick up on the, the theme of it from our director of financial aid. I don't think he's in the room, Carl mm -hmm. Lumen, but it, you know, a thoughtful Wesleyan thinker, reader, probably been at most of the Chamberlain lectures through the years. Mm -hmm. But did John Wesley's thoughts of taxing to help the poor promote a welfare state or providing work opportunities? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, so the idea of a welfare state is definitely not in the period. Right. I do think, though. Okay. Let's look. I'll take, let's let's talk British politics. They'll so keep it out of American politics. <laughs> it was a it was a Methodist inspired man who ended up um, being the father of the national health system in Britain. Now he was an atheist when he did that, but he was raised a Methodist. And then it was Margaret Thatcher who was raised a Methodist who you know, took down much of the welfare state of Britain in the 80s and 90s. And they were both driven by a Wesleyan vision, I think. Um, you know, uh, Thatcher was driven by a vision of hard work producing um, what, she, what she believed to be a government to serve the, the, the interests of the people that didn't encumber them, right? Whereas um, 
the founder of the NHS saw the role of government as, as, as providing at minimum this care for their general health and welfare. Both are actually, you can find both perspectives in John Wesley. Um, does Wesley promote a welfare state? Now I'll say this, and I'm, I do touch on this tomorrow, but there was a system of, uh, it was called the poor laws in the 18th century. And, and that system actually worked fairly well to care for uh, those who are in need at the local level. And it was administered at the local level. In fact, it was often administered by, either by the parish priest or the grocer. And um, it, it, we actually have, we have listings of, of what they did for, at various times. And it's, and it's, you know, you got the name of, you know, Sally needs such and such to feed her four children, right? Or Tom needs, or actually they wouldn't say Tom, Thomas needs, you know, such and such to repair the, the hole in his roof. And they would find a way for, you know, for, for the local funding that was given by the poor laws to be distributed uh, in the locality. Notice the relationality of that, by the way. Um, Methodism then adds a whole other layer to this with their small groups because they watch over one another in love. It's not a government program though. So you do have the government program, which is at the 18th century welfare state, maybe. Uh, but then on top of that, you have this Methodist system of caring for one another because they get to know each other in those small groups where they're not just concerned about their spiritual welfare, but they're in fact concerned about the physical and emotional and mental uh, welfare of those with whom they meet and know so much about, right? When you have to answer questions like, did you sin this week? in your small group <laughs> you get to know each other pretty well um and in fact they grew to love one another and so it was actually out of their love for one another that we see this added layer on top of that social network so uh, it doesn't quite fit the social welfare state no um but in fact calls christians to responsibility that's for sure that's oh, yeah well, unfortunately, we're going to have to end our time because we have some of you who are required to be on here for your classes, and those classes are going to be starting now. So I know, for instance, like our worship co course taught by Dr. Adley Charles is starting at 745. So you're welcome to exit out of this Zoom and go into another Zoom, go into whatever room it is. Um, and we can stay around here and talk a little bit more. We have another lecture tonight, uh, tomorrow night at 630. Tonight, let's keep going, folks. And I, I, there was a few questions I didn't get to. And they were more related to just a biblical doctrine of sanctification. And here, here's the, the put on the dean hat. We won't be able to answer those questions tonight, but you can sign up now for spring classes. And you can take biblical basis of holiness with Dr. Chris Lorstefer. Or you can take biblical theology where those questions will be answered. And we'll even have you write a paper about it. So. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, we didn't have time for more questions. But even if you'd like to submit some questions online that we could even... Uh, try to work at getting Dr. Denker to provide an answer for that. Let's just close in prayer here. Jesus, we are thankful that you are with us. We thank you for the witness of John Wesley as communicated here by Dr. Denker. We pray that we be faithful to the cause that you have raised us up for as a people, as Wesley Biblical Seminary, and the churches where we serve ultimately in service of your kingdom and your purposes in the world. We say this all to the glory of our triune God and in Jesus' name, amen.